Thanks, Evan, for a nice talk about community. Uh, I'm going to talk about community a little bit towards the end, but we're actually going to do a little more technical stuff in this talk, talk about MERB. Uh, MERB is a web framework that is a little bit different from some others. Uh, taking a couple different approaches as far as being a little more modular, a little more agnostic as far as backends go. Uh, you know, these SQL databases have been the way to store data for a long time now, but we're seeing all kinds of new, new ways of storing data, CouchDB, StrokeDB, ThruDB, SimpleDB, you know, MimcacheDB, all these different kind of persistence models that maybe fit a web kind of mashup situation better than a, a relational database uh, as everybody moves kind of towards cloud computing and all this stuff. Uh, MERB is kind of my experimentation ground for this. Uh, it's really good for building web services on and for not, not handcuffing you into a certain situation. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a quick look at some of the guiding principles that I've, that I've had with this project. Um, it kind of grew, this project has grew, grown out of some frustration with some other projects that will remain unnamed. Um, <laughs> prefer simplicity over magic as much as possible. Uh, there's no need to have monuments to personal cleverness in your code if you don't need them. Simple is usually better, it's be it scales better in the long run, people can read it later, usually runs faster. And Ruby opens up a huge array of, of features and metaprogramming techniques that you can use to accomplish goals. There are many ways to accomplish the same thing in Ruby, which is great. And, it, and it's part of why I love Ruby. But just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it as your first weapon of choice. Uh, you probably have all read recently, there's been this whole thing you know, monkey patching is destroying Ruby. And it's not, it's not destroying Ruby, but it should not be your first weapon of choice. As the Ruby community grows, you know, lots of people have come for the Rails and stayed for the Ruby. And there's, there's just, you know, as, as our community grows, there's gonna be more and more code. You're gonna be using other people's libraries. It's time for people to grow up a little bit and be a little more responsible about code you write. I mean, in your own applications, your application stack, do all the gratuitous metaprogramming you want. But if you're going to write code for other people to use to build their stuff on top of, we need to be a little more responsible about what we put in our libraries. Because as the community keeps growing, you know, the open classes, uh, everything can be changed at runtime, is one of the most powerful features of Ruby but it can cause a lot of problems and hard to track down things if you're not very careful with how you use it. So simplicity is better than magic 99% of the time. Having the magic when you can't get that last 1% is what makes Ruby one of the best, my favorite language. Um, just kind of, I kind of got ahead of myself. This is framework code I'm writing here. So no gratuitous use of symbol to proc or returning or any of these little things that may add, well, in some people's minds may add a little more readability or elegance to the code. Uh, in my mind, elegant is getting things done with as little code as possible in the simplest way possible. That code will scale much further, not as far as you know, scalability runtime wise, which it will, but scalability in coming back to it later and be able to understand it, having other people come back to it later and be able to understand it. And building a framework, you're building a foundation for everybody else to build their houses on top of. And you don't need a foundation that is crazy, right? <laughs> so when in doubt, Benchmark and profile has been a guiding principle. You know, there, you know, Ruby has a bunch of quirks, and as you use it more and more, you can kind of start to get a feel for what's expensive and what's not. 
but in reality, you're almost always going to be wrong about what the bottleneck is in a certain piece of code, uh, you know, to a certain extent. So benchmarking and profiling is really the only way to know for sure what a problem area is. And know your runtime and how it acts. Ruby is a complex animal, and learning its, all its different variables and all the different ways that it behaves will really benefit you uh, in the long run. Um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of saying, oh, look how expressive this is. Look how can we do this. We can dynamically define these methods and you know, generate all this code at runtime. And that's a, gr you know, that's a great thing to be able to do, especially in experimental programming and stuff. But uh, as the Ruby community scales, I implore library writers to keep this kind of stuff in mind. Uh, there's a bunch of different stuff we could talk about as far as Ruby performance quirks, you know, like methods defined with defined method rather than a normal def or three times slower to call. You know, I already said symbol to proc is slow. There's just a bunch of idioms that may take one line out of your code, one or two lines, and you may think is elegant, but uh, there's, couple, there's different ways to think about elegant, right? There's this looks so elegant. There's also this runs so elegant, right? Um, no code is ever going to be faster than no code, right? So <laughs> keep it simple, right? Uh, this is a good model to live by. No need to just generate volumes and volumes of code when a few lines will do. Uh, I, always, I get asked a lot of times why I built another web framework when we all have, when we have Rails and we have this, you know, it's a great thing with Rails, why fracture the community, why, why, why? Uh, because I, I wanted to, why not, right? Um, it's fun, it started as a hack, and it just got fun, and I've been working on it for a few years now almost, a year and a half at least, and it's been a fun experiment. Um, Rails was so pioneering and has so many awesome ideas in it uh, that I just really love, and it has some things in it that I really loathe. And that's fine. And Rails is an awesome platform, and I, you know, I still fully support it. But I just, you know, it was a little too opinionated for me, and I had some differences of opinion. And, it, you know, Rails is like, nothing can beat it for the 80-20 rule, at least for the 80 part of that rule, right? You can get up and running and get an application done faster in Rails than you can in MERB and you can make it that first 80%, and if you're building an app that 80% that is all you're ever gonna need, then please don't use Merv, go with Rails, because it's gonna get you there faster. But when you, you know, as, as the web advances, and there's all this world of service-oriented architecture, and REST, and web services, and mashups, and all this kind of stuff, there's, you know, and hosting all the hundreds of applications we hosted at Engine Yard, I see all these pain points when people are trying to push that last 20% and they have to fight against the framework. So MERB is kind of written in a way where it gets out of your way. It might not be as, you know, rad, you know, rapid application development wise. Uh, so it might take you a little, you know, a couple extra days to set up when you're getting started or whatever, but it's going to scale you better later as far as when you want to do something that it was not intended to, to do, you know, that I haven't thought of yet or, or, you know, that's not part of the framework because the whole idea of the code in MERB is to get out of your way and allow you to cherry pick features you need rather than say, here it is, like it or leave, you know, like it or leave it or fight with it if you have to leave the golden path. So we hear this a lot, right? Developer time is expensive. Servers are cheap, so who cares if, you know, uh, there's always been a meme, oh, Rails doesn't scale. Well, I can tell you firsthand that Rails completely does scale. I've seen it, you know, numerous times and time again. Just doesn't do so efficiently, so you're going to pay for it on the back end, which, you know, is a valid trade-off. Uh, so, you know, who cares about efficiency? Just throw more servers at the problem. It won't, you know, you get your application done quicker, but, you know, applications have to run for a long time. So throwing servers at the problem only goes so far, right? And 
course, I'm happy to sell you more servers. <laughs> but you hear this a lot too. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. La la la. Well, post mature optimization is the root of all hosting bills. Okay? So trust me on that one. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, let's get back to Merb. So, what's new in Merb? It's been around for like a year and a half. It's grown pretty organically over that time and started to get a, uh, a lot more people actually using it around the end of last year and kind of took a step back and looked at it and said, okay, now it's not a hack anymore. People are really going to be using it for production applications. Let's take a step back, tear this thing down to its roots, and build it back up again the way it should be. Let's get rid of any, any remaining things I don't like in there, and let's clean it all up, make it really what it's supposed to be. So uh, Yehuda and I spent like January and February completely taking it apart, putting it back together in a pretty modular fashion. So we've split it up into a Merb core gem, which is basically your HTTP abstraction, your controllers and views rendering, your bootloader for you know, determining the load order of the framework, your server tools, and your, your web service, uh, like REST type implementation and routing. And that's the small core. You can, you can get an app going and start using it with just core. And you can go a long ways with that. And then we have Merb More, which is a whole bunch more gems uh, for different functionality, caching, Haml, all kinds of different stuff. So the idea is you start with core, which is only, you know, which is the small package. And if you, you start a new app and you boot it up on core, it only uses like 12 megs of RAM. So you can write these really tiny, fast web services for when you need to you know, throw something up here and have a back end for your Rails app or throw something up there to proxy in between S3 and your, and your uh, download so you can authenticate and still stream right through Merb from S3 to your client. Uh, uh, we've rebuilt the framework on top of Rack. Like Merb originally stood for Mongrel and ERB uh, when it was first a little hack and, it, and I had really tight integration with Mongrel uh, for streaming and a number of other things. And that served us very well. Um, but now that it's become a, a framework all on its own right and people are using it in all kinds of different situations, uh, we standardize on Rack. And Rack is a web server abstraction layer. Basically, it distills a web request down into a, a method or an object or a proc that has a call method and takes an environment hash, which is like your C basic CGI hash of all the different headers and the post body and stuff coming in from the request, and you return an array, which is the status, the hash of the headers, and the body that responds to each. So it distills a web application down into basically a proc, a callable object, and if you adhere to this interface, you can run on basically any web server available to Ruby. Right now we have adapters for Ebb, Evented Mongrel, FastCGI, Mongrel, Thin, Webrick. There's a Lightspeed one in the works. Uh, so we can now run on any of these web servers, including CGI as well, but that's you know, a little slow loading the whole framework every time. But this gives us a nice way to be able to run on any kind of, any kind of setup you, you could ever imagine. And you know, there's different advantages uh, I'm, there's been a lot of blogging and stuff lately about Thin and Ebb, which are these event-driven web servers that are really fast. But there's, there's trade-offs, right? So Mongrel has been like the staple, stable way to run Rails applications. And it pretty much is still the winner overall, right? Mongrel is a threaded web server, so every request that comes in spawns a new thread, <coughs> accepts the socket, sets things up, dispatches to Rails, right? So Mongrel wins when you have varying response times in your application. Like if you have some long pages, you know, more than two, three, four, five seconds, or you're making blocking calls to other web services, other threads can still kind of be scheduled and you can still accept new connections and run. 
Whereas with the event-driven web servers, Ebb, Event, and Mongrel, and Thin, uh, they are much faster, since they don't have the overhead of threading, they're event-driven servers, they're much faster as long as all of your requests are very short. So if you have like a web service or an application that's never going to have requests more than a second or two long, then you're going to get much better performance on an event-driven web server. But as soon as you have variable length requests or you're doing long blocking calls, the event-driven servers are going to fall on their face because one blocking call it can block the event loop, which means no other sockets get accepted, no other connections <coughs> can be processed. So there's a big trade-off. So it's nice to be able to support any of these models for different applications. Some applications can really get a lot of uh, you know, advantage out of using an event-driven server. Uh, but in general, Mongrel is still like the best option for a general purpose application. Uh, <clears throat> building Merb on top of Rack has given us some really interesting possibilities. In every Merb application you generate, there is a config rack.rb file, and this is what comes in the default rack.rb file, run Merb wrap application new. Uh, so this is just the default, it just runs your Merb application in a standard way. Uh, but having this config file, Rack has a no since Rack has distilled a web request down to a call method that takes an environment and returns an array of the status headers and body. It also has an idea of middleware and running multiple applications in the same process. So you can create middleware that would do like, you know, do logging or like wrap your call into your application in a profiler or whatever, and you can stack this middleware so that as a request comes in, it will go through the stack and do various things. So for example, you know, this is our standard Merb application doing nothing extra except for just dispatching Merb. Uh, let's take a look at something else. So say we have, you know, say we have an application that's a standard Merb app, does a bunch of web stuff and everything, but you also have an API, like say you're Twitter, and you have an API that's doing 80% of your traffic, and it's, you know, it's just a simple call that's returning XML or JSON or whatever. Uh, it's, there's no reason to go through the whole routing, instantiating controllers, dispatching through a whole framework if you're not, if you don't need all the filters and you don't need views and all that kind of stuff, you're just returning some data. You can get, a, you can get away with a much faster way of doing it. So let's break this down a little bit. This is a simple API handler. So we put this in our, in our rack.rb file. And basically, this, uh, it takes, in initialize, it takes an app, which is our Merb rack application, and stores it away. And it has its own call where it's taking the environment in. So uh, it's going to take the environment in. And then the way rack middleware works is down here at the bottom, we can say, use API handler, run Merb rack application new. What that's going to do is it's going to create a stack by calling initialize on the API handler and passing in the application we're running to store it away. And then it's going to insert itself in front of every request. So when a request comes in, uh, this, this API handler is going to get called. We're going to instantiate a new Merb request object so we can get access to params or anything else we would want. And then we're going to check if the request path matches API as a simple example. And we're going to capture whatever comes after API. And if it does match, we get a request in. We're going to, here's, our, here's our array that we return. We've got status 200 for yes, this request was OK. We've got a hash of headers, content type equals text JSON. And then we can call like into our API model. You know, this is a very simplified version call into our API model, get the JSON from the regex match, and return that as the body. And so on every request, we can short circuit the, the whole framework by checking if it's an API call and returning just JSON right away. And like you can't get much faster than that in Ruby. There's really like very low overhead to this. Now if the request doesn't match, we're going to just fall back and call our Merb application, and it's going to go ahead and go through the whole framework and dispatch your controllers and your views and everything. So this is really powerful. I don't know if anybody's ever written custom mongrel handlers for the Rails application where they mount them in front to be able to handle different things. 
Well, this is very similar, except for it will work across any web server or setup you're using. And there's a lot of different stuff you can do with this. There's also, there's a bunch of middleware that comes with Rack. There's like a common logger, a pretty exception screen. There is a, a cascade, which means you say, okay, here's a new cascade, and you pass it in an array of, app, of Rack applications and say, try all these applications, and the first one that returns a non-404, we're gonna render that. So by having this available you know, to put in front of your MERB application, you can, you can just have so much flexibility. And if you don't need MERB at all, I'd highly suggest everybody check out Rack and build yourself a simple little one feature website on it or something. It's really, really cool and it's really easy to make an application. Just define a proc or a class that has a call method, takes the environment and returns an array. It can't get much simpler than that. So that's the power of Rack. Uh, Merv also has a really powerful router. Uh, can do full RESTful stuff, very similar to Rails, nested resources. And you can see here this bottom part is like the exception detail screen uh, where you can view like all your named routes and everything. So it can do most of the stuff, 95% of the RESTful routing and stuff that Rails does in a similar way, but it also has some much more powerful features where we can basically dispatch based on anything in the request object, the user agent, subdomains, the host name, you know, anything you could think of. Here, here we're using the user agent. So in this, the first route, a request comes into foo slash whatever, and this route will only match if the user agent is, is you know, Microsoft Internet Explorer or Gecko. Otherwise, it's going to fail. And in the, in the hash here, you can see title has this little you know, bracket one. That will be replaced with the match from the regex. And then we have user agent is basically a match data object. So there's really powerful ways to take a request and pull it apart and route based on anything. Uh, this bottom example is an example of deferred routes, which means instead of you know, just checking if it matches, we can insert some arbitrary logic. So here we'll say, you know, if you match bar with a placeholder after it, uh, defer to this block. And the block takes the request object and the params hash that, from the incoming request. And you can do anything you want in here. So in your router, you could call into the database and say, you know, if, if we can find by this parameter, we'll return a hash. So Merb's router, when a route matches, it returns a hash that has the controller to, to instantiate the action to call and any other parameters that could come in in the params hash. So here we're basically deferring this route and changing the way it works based on some call out of the database. We could easily do like, you know, check the subdomain, look it up in the database and tell it which controller to route to or, or whatever based on that. So with a deferred route, you either return a hash of controller actions and any other params, or you return nil or false, and that route won't match, and it will continue on to the next and the next and the next and try it going from there. So it just gives you a lot more power over how your application is going to match up to requests coming in. So another really cool feature is the provides API. I really didn't like how, I mean, I really like the idea of Rails RESTful web service interface, you know, write these respond to blocks, you know, respond to wants XML, wants HTML, and be able to serve different content types based on the accept header or the format or whatever. That's like a really powerful idea, but I just hate how ugly the respond to blocks are, and it just seemed like, it just didn't seem like the nicest API. So we've done something a little different in MERB. By default, all controllers provide HTML. But in this little example, we are going to also provide JSON, YAML, and XML. And it might be a little hard to see, but up at the top, we've got MERB's MIME types. And we're going to say, you know, we're going to say MERB add a MIME type for YAML. We're going to give it a symbol of the method to call on an object to get YAML from that object, so to YAML. And then we're going to say, 
here's the accept headers where when a request comes in that says I accept text YAML or application X YAML, then that's what's going to match. So we've set these up for YAML, HTML, XML, and JSON. These ones are built into the framework, but you could easily set up your own foobar MIME type with a two foobar method. And then in this show method here, this is one other feature of MERB that's pretty cool is you can write your methods like normal met Ruby methods. You don't have to depend on a magic params hash. The params hash is there, but if you define your method to take arguments on the dispatch on the way through MERB, it's going to say, oh, this show method has an ID, right? So I'm going to look up the ID out of the parameters and pass it in as a normal method argument rather than making you play with this magic params hash. Params hash is still available, but I find this like to be much more Ruby-ish. Uh, so show takes an ID, finds a post, and then we say display post, right? So based on what the accept header coming in is, when you call display, say we request XML. When you say display post, what's going to happen is it's going to determine what the request wanted as far as a MIME type, and then it's going to call the two whatever method on that. So it's going to call, you say we request XML, it's going, to re, it's going to reply by calling to XML on the post object and returning that value. So, and if there is no, and there's also, you know, if there's a template on disk, the template will override. So if there's like an HTML template or whatever, that will override. You have templates for different content types. But doing it this way, there's also a normal render method, but display is pretty useful. It falls back to render. And it gives you this way to abstract what you're displaying to the client. So not only could we do this with just the two XML on like an active record object or a data mapper object, but if you wanted to get into like the idea of a presenter where instead of using a template, you want to, wrap, you want to have an object that takes a number of child objects and figures out how to display them itself, you could have a presenter object and say, you know, find a post and put it in at sign post, find a comment and put it in at side comment, and then say, you know, display presenter new and pass in the post and the comment, and then to XML or to whatever will get called on the presenter, which can decide how to display those objects it contains. So it just gives us much more leeway in the future to change the way we want to display objects or how we want to handle that. Uh, I don't have code in there yet, but I am working on a, a canvas style renderer where instead of using actual templates, you use objects that know how to build themselves and display as, X, as HTML or XML or whatever. So that'll be coming pretty soon. But this just leaves us really flexible uh, way of, of doing things. And so MERB actions are much more like Ruby methods than an action in Rails. They can take arguments from the parameters and whatever they return is going to go back to the client. So there's no auto rendering. You, ever, you always have to call display or render or something because the return, on, you know, the return value of the method is what's going to go to the client. And this opens up a lot more flexibility as well. You can just, you know, you don't have to use MERB's rendering or display or anything. You can just return a string that you built from whatever and that will get sent back to the client. Or you can return an open I.O. handle, like a, you can open an I.O. object or a file or whatever, and if you return an, an open I.O. handle, Merv will see that and it will st stream it to the client as a file. Or if you return a proc object, it, Merv will see that and it will say, oh, well, this isn't a string or a file, it's a proc, so I'm going to call that proc and pass in the response stream as an argument so that I can, you know, drop a proc out of this method and in that proc I can like write to the response any way I want, streaming wise, do loops over whatever and, and write chunks out to the client. So this opens up all kinds of flexibility. Like one of the use cases for this, being able to return a proc is say you, you know, say you have S3 files that are private, that are password protected and you want to be able to stream them down to your user what you need to authenticate in your MERB app first, and you don't want to show them the S3 URL. So you could have a request come in, you could 
open a connection to S3, and inside of a proc that you return from your, from your action, you can start reading a chunk from S3 and writing it to the response right away and have a loop that goes over and does that. So that a request comes into MERB for a certain S3 object, MERB authenticates, make sure the user can see that object, and then it opens a stream from S3 and reads a chunk, and write, as soon as it reads a chunk, it writes a chunk right to the client. So it's like a proxy in the middle, and it doesn't have to like download the whole thing into a buffer and then download to the client again. So MERB is all about services and being a man in the middle or whatever. It just is really flexible for dealing with the web in general. Um, quickly, in MERB more, there's a bunch of code generators. There's a asset bundling with callbacks, so you can say, you know, when I first boot the application server, I want you to go and grab all my JavaScript files, compile them into one file, and call out to JSMin or YUI Minimizer or whatever, and pack those into one file and then return that. Uh, there's mailers and parts, which uh, MERB has an abstract controller type, which doesn't know anything about the web, but it knows how to do before filters and after filters and how to render and use like the provides API and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that gave us a lot of flexibility. MERB web controllers that you use on the web, you know, take the request and the response and they set up the session and the params and they know all about the web and all this stuff. Parts are kind of like components done right. They're behave exactly the same as your other MERB controllers. You write them the same. They have their own before and after filters. They can have layouts, their own views, their own whole directory. But they aren't directly callable from the web. They're callable from other controllers or views. So you can encapsulate little components, you know, little applets of your site in a full controller with filters and layouts and templates and everything, and then call that from a view or from a web controller to build your application in a more modular way. And so those are just a subclass of MERB's abstract controller type. Same thing with mailers. The mailers are just another controller type. In, in Rails, mailers are like, what are they? Are they a controller? Why do they live in the models directory? Who knows, right? <laughs> <coughs> but it's much more consistent here. Mailers are just another type of controller. They have templates. You can add attachments, render views, and, and shoot them out. And it just makes you so then your mailers can have layouts, filters, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we, got, we support Haml as a first class citizen. So you can use Haml and ERB, and you can intermix the two and have partials that are Haml that call ERB partials or whatever. Uh, Merb takes a different approach to how it handles templates. When you boot the server, it runs through all the templates in your application, has the template engine parse those into Ruby code, the intermediate step, and then it installs those as methods in a inline template module. So your templates get fully compiled and turned into a method. So when you render, basically all it has to do is figure out which template you were thinking of and then call that method. So there's no so rendering is really, really fast, and partials are basically just method calls instead of a whole, you know, check on the disk and blah, 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 all this stuff. It basically turns all your templates into methods, which has a huge performance advantage. Uh, Merb Core more also has the action args plugin, which is the way of letting you pass in arguments to your actions. And that's actually pretty cool. It uses parse tree and Ruby to Ruby to like inspect all of your controllers and when the server boots and figure out what the actions are and what arguments they take and how to pass that stuff in and assemble it together. Uh, we've got a nice caching plug-in and all the other essentials. And this stuff is all opt-in. You can start building an app with just core and then as you need pieces, you add a piece here, add a piece there, or you could just say require Merb more and get it all at once. And we also have Merb plugins which has typos, I guess. Darta mapper, that's a new one. Anyway, so Merb officially supports three different ORMs, data mapper, active record, and, and SQL. And has, you know, there's a plugin for each one of these. You can tell it to use which ORM you want to use. Uh, 
and it knows how to do migrations for each one and how to integrate those into the application and load them properly and everything. So it gives you flexibility to choose what you want. My personal preference is Data Mapper. Uh, it's an awesome project. I know Yehuda is going to be speaking about it a little later today, and he can tell you more about that. But if you like have a Rails application and you're having performance issues with it, and you need to create maybe a little web service or a little component part of your Rails application written in MERB, and you have all Active Record objects, you can actually build a MERB app. And since the framework is so modular, you can, in the configuration options, you can say, here's my MERB app. Everything lives in here, except the models directory is actually the models directory of my Rails app. So did you have a question? Yeah. So pull that in instead and load those models and go from there. So most Rails plugins that deal with active record will work fine in Merv. Plugins that deal with action pack are a little iffy. You might have to port or whatever. Uh, yeah, so we've, you know, we've got a helpers plugin with a bunch of form helpers and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot more being worked on. So if you want to contribute to Merv or just like play around a little bit, you can, it's, on, it's up on GitHub. Please go fork the project and play with it. The, the, we've been really enjoying using Git as our, and GitHub is an awesome project to, to get involved with, and using it as our way of you know, source control. It brings a whole, new, uh, a whole new way of working with a project like this. Uh, as people want to make a new feature, they can go on GitHub and click fork and get their own fork of Merb and go ahead and you know, make their feature, whatever it is, and then they can send me a pull request. They can say, here, my feature's finished. Here's a pull request. And the next time I log into GitHub, I'll say, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so sent you a pull request with this feature added. And I can just say, oh, git pull. And I'll pull in his feature into my main repo. And it's, it's really cool because it fosters experimentation. It's not one subversion repository that, you know, you you know, most people don't have commit rights to or whatever, and it's really, you know, subversion is really, branches are just ugly, they're hard to merge. It's just a, it's not a, it's not a conducive thing to experimentation, because if you want to really take somebody's, you know, take a, take Merv or Rails or whatever, and do some drastic, drastic changes, with sub, if you're doing it from their subversion repository, you can't commit incrementally, and you can't commit your changes, so you have to make this monolithic, code fist patch, right? And shove it up their maintainers, whatever. <laughs> and that's no fun, right? This is great. Have you actually, do you have any statistics or even anecdotal evidence that this is uh, encouraging people to contribute in a way that it doesn't in the centralized uh, repo? Yes, I would definitely think so. There's like, 60 or 70 forks of Merb on GitHub right now. And a number, of, you know, I've gotten a great bunch of features from a number of different people, and there's been stuff that I didn't like, and they've still maintained their own fork of that. And so that really, it really fosters experimentation because people can make a fork, do something maybe crazy or maybe different, and if it doesn't make it back into mainline, they can still easily maintain their fork with the features and still pull from mainline much easier than they could do with subversion. Like, probably everybody that works with Rails has their own private, not really a fork, but like their own patches that they put on every project because these things they want are not in core and they can't get them in or it's just too much of a hassle. So everybody's got their own little privately maintained edge case stuff. And if you were working in Git instead of subversion, you could maintain your own fork and still commit to it, still pull from the main repo. It just opens up for a much more, I, I don't know, it's just a much more conducive environment for experimentation. Uh, so I just wanted to say you said earlier that um, Merv takes a little longer to set up, and that's definitely true today. But it's definitely our mission to make Merv as easy to set up as Rails. We just, we just value things like um, being able to be modular and hackability at this particular point in time over trying to guess what the correct default is, right? So as Merv gets more mature, it becomes more obvious what the right defaults are. 
And so the mission is to have a similar experience to Rails where we have a thin layer on top of Merv, all the defaults that people can use, right? And then you can just take it off or override pieces instead of having to basically monkey patch what already is there. So our goal is to have a really modular system that, is, that allows to make it really easy to add defaults. And so it will be really easy to set up with that. Like I said, it's just not the case today. I want to mention too that Rails is doing a great thing and they're moving to Git shortly, sometime next month, which I, th I really applaud and I think that's a vast move forward for them because it's going to really level the playing field. It's not going to, the core team won't, you know, won't be as much of a monolithic thing anymore because anybody could have their own fork with their own features and it kind of promotes this survival of the fittest thing. If somebody's got a cooler branch, some people use it, or if somebody's got a branch with features that somebody needs for a certain application, they can use that. It just, it kind of like, if it's an open source project to begin with, distributed version control, I think, is a much higher level way of working with a community because it allows people to go off on their own tangents and still be able to commit incrementally and the merging and the branching and stuff is just so much easier. situation, right? Well, so if you have, if your application is like 90% really fast actions, you could like run those on Thin or Evented Mongrel or, or Ebb. Ebb is like really fast. And then you could run your slow actions on Mongrel, right? And then in your Nginx or whatever your front server is, you can say, okay, any of these URLs that start with slash slow will go to the mongrels and the other stuff, anything else will go to the thins or whatever. <coughs> well, yeah, you can't, I mean, you can only, well, that's not true. If you really wanted to, you could fire up multiple servers in the same process. On, okay, the question was, what was the question? The question was, could you run like an event-driven server for certain actions and mongrel for other actions that are slower? And the answer is yes. With Rack, it's all just adapters and servers. And with Mer the, the way Merv has all these uh, different modules built in for web servers, you could actually, in the same process, start a mongrel for your application on port 3000 and start a thin or an ebb on port 3001. And you would still have to have something up in front, like Nginx or whatever, to say, okay, these requests go to this one and these requests go to that one, but they could still be in the same process. With your company, do you have any large clients that are using Merb? Yeah, we have uh, quite a few people that are using Merb. A lot of people have used, are using it like in conjunction with the Rails applications for pulling out their web services or their file uploads or something. We have a number of applications that are about to launch that are all fully on Merb. And uh, there's a number of actually really large companies that I'm not allowed to really say their names that are using it for some performance intensive stuff, uh, a lot of web service stuff. And that's where it really shines. I'm not trying to be as fully, as full of a stack as Rails is. I like Merb to be more of a experimentation playground for new persistence backends, new ideas of having web services, all that kind of stuff. But adoption is, is rapidly picking up. You talked earlier really on about keeping things really tight. What mm -hmm. kind of tools do you have to use for profiling when you find that, say, your code is reaching middle and you're getting into nothing around middle? Uh, RubyProf is pretty much the best profiler for Matt's Ruby. Um, if you're running on Rubinius, Rubinius has a really nice built-in sampling profiler that doesn't affect performance at all. Uh, your code runs at full speed, but you get samples of what's going on. Uh, you know, the debuggers, Ruby debug helps. But yeah, basically, so there's a couple different ways of doing it. There's, always, there's profiling, setting up a profiling action, and Merb has a built-in underscore, underscore, profile, underscore, underscore method that you can give uh, a block of code to run and say, run this 100 times or 1,000 times and show me everything that takes more than 0.1% of the time. And so you could wrap this around all the calls to your application and have it print out an HTML uh, graph of where the performance critical places are. 
Also, I do a lot of stuff where, okay, I'm writing, I've got this idiom here where I'm using inject or I'm using this or that or the other. So I'll break out a little piece of functionality and say, okay, I can do this these five different ways and then I'll write a benchmark for each one and see which one is faster or has features I want or whatever. And in the MURB source, there's a simple benchmarks directory that has like a bunch of uh, little, a bunch of those little files where I compare different ways of doing things and decide which one's better. Anything for memory? Memory profiling, uh, Bleak House works pretty well. You have to like, it has a custom Ruby interpreter that's implemented the, the memory uh, and garbage collector to get a bunch more stats out of it. That works pretty well. Uh, there's a really good article from the guys at Pluron. They did a bunch of profiling of Rails applications and found a bunch of little things that were affecting memory and they have a good write-up of that. I will, uh, I'll post my slides to my blog at Brainsplat later today and, and include some links for this kind of stuff for you. Um. Well, I was kind of confused how uh, you talked about uh, taking parameters to the request and mapping them to arguments to the action. Mm -hmm. Can you go to more detail? Right. Yeah, let's take a look at. Uh, so, say we have a foo controller and we have a create method, right? Your standard RESTful controller. The old way of doing it would be to. Can you guys not see that? Let me, okay, the question was. Can you explain a little bit more about how the uh, parameter passing for arguments that are MERB actions works? So the old standard way of doing it would be, you know, create and you'd say, you know, posts or whatever, foo.create params foo, right? And foo would be a hash of whatever the attributes of that object are. Uh, the way MERB action args works is instead of writing that, you can write create foo, uh, foo, and then instead of having to use the params hash, you just, what happens in during the dispatch of the, of the MERB application setting up your controller, it will know that your create method takes a foo parameter, and it will look in the params for a foo key like you have up here for params foo, and it will pull that out and pass in basically params foo as the foo param argument to your method. So it's not, it's kind of just a little syntax sugar. It just kind of cleans things up a little bit, allows you to, you know, pass in all this kind of stuff. So you could have an action, you know, that takes uh, an ID and a name, and the ID could be, have a default of 42, and the name could have a default of Gerald or whatever. So then instead of having to pull, you know, having to do all these hash lookups and pull all this stuff out of the params hash all the time, you can just say, oh, well, this method takes these arguments and can have defaults. And as part of the dispatch, MERB will know that your action takes these parameters and will fill them in from the request. That's a good question. So, what was the question? The question is, how does it know? Right. So, it's a little bit complex. Like, it uses a library called Ruby Parse Tree and Ruby to Ruby. So, when the server boots, as your controller classes are loaded, each one of them gets run through Parse Tree. So, it gets turned into the abstract syntax tree, which is basically like a Lisp-looking S expression, the abstract view of your code, which is what Matt's Ruby interpreter takes all of your code, parses it into this sex P, they call it, and then it walks around this tree executing the code. So in that, using the parse tree gem, you can say, give me the parse tree for this method, and it will give you this nested array with symbols and stuff in it, and you can say, okay, I want the arguments node out of this array, and I, so I can know that this method takes a foo parameter with this default and takes a bar parameter with this default. And then I store those away in a hash. And as part of the dispatch, when it comes in, I know, okay, for this control, foo controller, for this create method, it takes these arguments. So 
put those in from the parameters from the request instead of, uh, instead of not. It's all done in Bootstrap, so there's no, there's no noticeable overhead of this. It's all like at Bootstrap, it does this thing, compiles, you know, gets the sexp, gets the parameters, memoizes them away in a hash that just gets used as a lookup during the dispatch. So there's no performance hit for it. Do you have development modes? So for, for this type of thing and also for templates, so if you change them while the server's running, you don't want to Yes. Right? Yeah, we've got a whole uh, in development mode, we've got a code reloader that for every file that gets loaded, it takes a note, okay, it says, okay, object constants, here's the constants in the program right now, and then it loads the file, and then it stores away which constants that file loaded, so that later, when that file m time changes on disk, and it can, before it reloads that file again, it goes through and removes all those constants that it knows this file is gonna create, and then it reloads the file again. And for templates in development mode, it will recompile the template on each call, or when, if it's changed. So if you're using parse tree to do the argument stuff, is it parse tree a compile check? Yes, it is. So uh, not really. I mean, it's, a, it's an opt-in feature. It's not in core. It's in more, so you can not use it if you don't want to. But there are, uh, we worked with a couple people, and there is now pre-compiled Windows binaries of parse tree and Ruby inline and Ruby to Ruby. That was the main thing, is like people on Windows were like, you know, crying because they don't usually have compilers, and it was a pain in the butt for them. So... Put more, you can't like, in your application. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I just meant like, doesn't that mean you can't freeze or more in your application? You, no, that doesn't mean that because the, uh, the compiled stuff doesn't actually live in the gem. It's part of, it's part of parse tree and Ruby to Ruby. So as long as you can get those gems installed, it doesn't actually have to compile anything on the fly. Uh, it's just they use Ruby inline to make it easier. So it is a pre-compiled thing. You can, you could freeze parse tree and Ruby to Ruby into your application, but that's not super advisable if you're gonna put it on different platforms. You'd be better off just installing those native gems on the platform first, or if it's really a pain in the butt, just not using it. The uh, action arts is really cool, and I really like that. But in my mind, that falls slightly on the side of magic. It does. So how do you decide where to draw the line between simplicity and magic? Well, it <coughs> kind of comes down to usefulness versus if you're not going to really use it. That's why it's not in core, right? It's in more, which is an opt-in thing. So it's not a core feature. But it's something that I've found in writing applications I, it just fits better with my brain. So yes, it is a little bit of magic. That's probably the most magic part of Merb. But uh, since it's an opt-in thing, and I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of joy out of it, I, I, kind of turn, I kind of turn my head on that one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it's magic behind the scenes. It is magic behind the scenes, but it makes it, it makes it more like just normal Ruby rather than these magic params that appear, you're like defining a method that takes arguments, right? And then you turn, and it kind of fits in with how Merv is just returning values instead of automatically rendering. You can also use those from other methods, right? Uh, what do you, what do you so mean? If you, call, if you come in on, on one, you can call another method in the, in the controller. Exactly. With our use. Yeah, exactly. That's so the pack up the without having to push it in the parameter hash and then pass it along, yeah. So it makes them just more like normal methods, basically. You mentioned dev and thing. Have you ever benchmarked them and test them? Yes, I have. Are you using both or one? Uh, well, we're at Engine Yard, we're mostly like 99% just straight mongrel because it is the better one size fits all solution. But we do have maybe 20 or so customers running on thin, and it's a trade-off. It's the, it's the classic event-driven versus threaded networking server deal. The thin is really fast, faster, a little bit faster than invented mongrel, and ebb is even faster yet. Ebb is 
is based on libEV, which is a, like a lib event kind of clone that's really fast, all written in C. And all of ebb is written in C, except for the very thin layer that dispatches to rack to your Ruby application. So ebb is like smoking fast for short requests. But both ebb and thin kind of fall on their face as soon as you have like intermixed long requests in there. So while they are really cool and, and like I like the projects a lot, I can't recommend them as just a full out replacement for Mongrel because they're not. They have different trade offs. I was just wondering because I small tested both of them. My worry was with Ebb in just pure C, mm -hmm. and I think at least on my little benchmarks it wasn't as stable as thin. Yeah. And a lot of people in the mainlands were kind of saying, well, if it's more Ruby, you can play more with it. You True. Know? And if it's just pure C, it takes a you whole know, different level to, to play with it. it. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's the classic trade off for speed in Ruby, you know, C extension versus pure Ruby. And Ebb is still very young. Like I wouldn't recommend anybody use it in production yet. It's still very, you know, very new, and it's gotten better, but it was kind of unstable and stuff. And but I mean, the C is all kind of hidden just for the web server part, since it exposes a rack interface, which Thin does as well. You're still able to do most of everything in Ruby as far as putting together and composing different applications and, and handlers and stuff. But yeah, it's like there is no panacea. These new event-driven web servers are not going to cure everybody's problems and make everything so much faster, especially for almost all applications I see in the wild have some requests that take two or three or 10 seconds. You know, they have a report. File uploads, yeah, file uploads <coughs> or, yeah, I mean, threaded mongrel beats all the other ones hands down for file uploads. Uh, because it can still o accept new connections while the files are being processed. Whereas with an event driven server, uh, you know, as soon as the, it can do all the networking without blocking, but as soon as it locks up Rails or whatever and you're doing the processing of the file, the whole time you're doing that processing of the file, no other connections are able to be processed. So the throughput of those event driven servers just like drops like this when there's long requests in the application. So you have to make the trade-off. And, and what uh, Tim said earlier is a good idea. Like if you have, you know, if you know that 90% of your application has really fast response times, it could greatly benefit from an event-driven web server. Maybe you, you know, at your front-end proxy server, you split off requests and send fast requests, you know, for certain URLs to the fast servers and you send the other slower uh, file uploads and stuff to your threaded mongrel. Basically, if you can separate by URL, you can do it and take the best of both. Exactly. Exactly, yeah, so. You're kind of hitting, you're, you're almost to kind of a 1.0 type of release. It's really stabilizing out a lot. Where do you really see it going after this? Uh, it depends. Like, I, you know, we just released 0.9.2 to Ruby Forge, which is the first release we've actually put on Ruby Forge of the whole complete new refactored code base. So I'm going to let that gel for a while, and I want to see a bunch of new applications written and launched before, before we'll go 1.0. 1.0 is still a little ways out because I want it to be very polished and I want it to, uh, you know, I want to get a bunch more applications using it in the wild and figuring out if, there's, if we're missing anything or if we need to take something away. So, you know, 1.0 is a pretty big stake in the sand for an open source project and I want it to be as perfect as possible. Uh, the direction it goes after that, we'll, we'll see. You know, I kind of have the, I kind of above the opinion that I don't, after 1.0 is out, it's going to be pretty much kind of feature complete. Anything else that needs to happen can be a plug-in since the whole thing is built very modular. So I don't foresee it just continuing on and adding and adding features and adding features. I'd rather see it become a community of you know, modular features that people can add or remove as they need. And doesn't have, you know, not everything, the framework doesn't have to do everything. It's nice when it does, and when your application kind of fits that mold, it's a great thing to have, you know, the framework do everything for you. But as applications get more complex and people, you know, glom together more web services and are building these, these crazy things, a lot of that stuff has to be in the application code. It's so application specific that bloating up a framework with features to support all these edge cases is not what I want to do. 
I just wanted to say that Edip has an option to do threaded request processing. Yes. It, yeah, it does. I haven't got to play with it much yet to see whether it kind of negates the benefit of having the event-driven server or not, spawning a thread for each request. But yeah, that's, there's also a, another thing I've been playing with for when you run uh, Merb on evented mongrel. Uh, event machine has this thing called deferrables where you can stop processing a request and like defer some processing to later so that the event loop can run again. So I've been playing with continuations, which probably aren't the best solution, and deferrables to be able to say, okay, here I've got this MERB action that's doing all this complex stuff that takes a lot of time, so in between each step I can like yield so that the event loop can run again and serve more requests and come back and c continue processing my stuff later. But that's all really experimental right now. I'm really excited about the spring work. I'd really like to try it. I went to the website, I noticed you don't have the five minute goal view. You mentioned in the beginning that really wasn't where you're at. Um, that might temper your adoption a little bit. Are you still planning on doing something? Yeah. So he said you went to the website and there is no like build a blog in five minute uh, thing. And yeah, uh, we were, that's another big thing that we're going to do before we release 1.0 yeah. is like copious documentation and tutorials and stuff. That's kind of what, like Merb is stabilized now to the point where there's not a lot left to be done. There's just a lot of trial and vetting by fire. So I'm going to be focusing on more some tutorials and, and stuff. And we're actually writing a book for Manning on Merb that will be coming out pretty soon. Um, but yeah, that's some, that's a place where, you know, we're on, there's a Merb IRC channel that's really active and really helpful. If you wanted to jump in there, we'd be happy to like get you up and running and, and go through some stuff. And if anybody wants to feel like writing some documentation, that would be great. Uh, along that lines, I wanted to mention another thing that I forgot to put in the presentation that I think is pretty cool about the way we're doing Merb. And that's our documentation and API standards. We've come up with a documentation format that you know, states what all the parameters are and their types and the return types and what a method can do. And whether, and we've, got, we've made a distinction between public API, semi-public API, and private APIs. And this is so, in our specs for Merb Core, we have private specs and public specs. And public specs are APIs that are a contract with my users that we will not change and that we'll try as hard as we can to not break. But the private API stuff is private, and that allows me to refactor the way the framework works or drastically change the under, underlying techniques without, as long as I don't break the public API. So I think that's a really kind of cool way of, of documenting a framework. And, uh, but yeah, I agree, we need more tutorials. And Merb has just kind of settled down now where I feel it's a stable platform for everybody to start building on, so I'm sure there will be more forthcoming. I think I'm going to have to wrap it up here. Everybody's probably been, got their sore butts by now. So thank you. And